Good evening, Townsend Church. Welcome to Good Friday. I'm glad that you're here. I wish that you were here with me in our sanctuary, but I am glad that you are where you are, that you are home safe and sound with your families. If we were to look back in time at the children of Israel and the way that they celebrated the feast of the Passover, that's exactly how they did it. They did it in their homes with their families. And so tonight, is going to be outside the box like we always like to do it. It's going to be something different. It's going to challenge our thinking and it's going to take us on a journey. But you get to do that in the confines of your home with your family. What a special night tonight is. When I look back over the events of this Holy Week, <clears throat> there are so many things that take place. In fact, Matthew, out of the 28 chapters that he writes about Jesus' life, eight of them cover from the triumphal entry through his resurrection. Mark and Luke both cover six chapters apiece. But then you get to John, and out of the 21 chapters that John writes, nine of them cover the triumphal entry until his resurrection. That's 43% of the writings that John did. 43%. This is important, folks. This is, this is the highlight of our Christian life. This is the thing that sets us apart from every other religion in the world. The death, the burial, and certainly the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And so when we look at those sections and those chapters of those, the writings that those men put out, <clears throat> it begins with the great triumphal entry and what an entry it was. But then throughout this week, there are a lot of parables, a lot of teachings that Jesus takes on, a lot of opportunities to teach us what we need to be doing and should be doing. There's also a lot of challenging to the religious leaders that are there. It's constantly challenging their teachings and, and what they're trying to promote. And then there are some predictions. There's some um, things that he says that's going to happen, and lo and behold, they will happen. And then there are just the normal accounts that we all know of. The Last Supper, the betrayal, the prayer at the garden, the beatings, uh, the denial by Peter, the, the crucifixion, and then, of course, the burial. <clears throat> and so here's what I want you to do. Over the next few moments... We're going to have some pictures on the screen, and there's going to be people from our church reading passages of Scripture. And at any given time during this time, if you want to pause the recording and just think about what was read, feel free to do that. You have all the time that you want. But think about what is being read. Try to feel the emotion and hear really what is happening in the life of Jesus and His disciples. Before we do this, let me pray, and then we'll listen to those that are reading. Father, I appreciate all that you do. May you continue to be glorified. May you continue to be honored. And may we tonight, as we are in our homes with our families, have the opportunity to express to you our ultimate devotion. But Lord, as the scripture is read, I pray that you would work on our hearts Allow us to be in the moment, to feel what they were feeling and to experience the emotion that was there. May you be glorified in all things. In Jesus' name, amen. So sit back and listen. When the hour had come, he sat down and the twelve apostles with him. Then he said to them, with fervent desire, I have desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I say to you, I will no longer eat of it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. Then he took the cup and gave thanks and said, Take this and divide it among yourselves. For I say to you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took bread, gave thanks and broke it, and gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Likewise, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is shed for you. Coming out, he went to the Mount of Olives as he was accustomed, and his disciples also followed him. When he came to the place, he said to them, Pray that you may not enter into temptation. And he was withdrawn from them, about a stone's throw, and he knelt down 
and prayed, saying, Father, if it is your will, take this cup away from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. Then an angel appeared to him from heaven, strengthening him. And being in agony, he prayed more earnestly, and his sweat became like great drops of blood falling down to the ground. When he rose up from prayer, and come to his disciples, he found them sleeping from sorrow. And he said to them, Why do you sleep? Rise and pray, lest you enter into temptation. And while he was still speaking, behold, a multitude, and he who was called Judas, one of the twelve, went before them, and drew near to Jesus to kiss him. But Jesus said to him, Judas, are you betraying the Son of Man with a kiss? When those around him saw what was going to happen, they said to him, Lord, shall we strike with the sword? And one of them struck the servant of the high priest and cut off his right ear. But Jesus answered and said, Permit even this. And he touched his ear and healed him. Then Jesus said to the chief priests, captains of the temple, and the elders who had come to him, Have you come out as against a robber with swords and clubs? When I was with you daily in the temple, you did not try to seize me. But this is your hour and the power of darkness. Now as they led him away, they laid hold of a certain man, Simon, a Cyrenian, who was coming from the country, and on him they laid the cross that he might bear it after Jesus. And a great multitude of the people followed him, and women who also mourned and lamented him. But Jesus, turning to them, said, Daughters of Jerusalem, do not weep for me, but weep for yourselves and for your children, for indeed the days are coming in which they will say, Blessed are the barren wombs that never bore, and breasts which never nursed. Then they will begin to say to the mountains, Fall on us, and to the hills, Cover us. For if they do these things in the green wood, what will be done in the dry? There were also two others, criminals, led with him to be put to death. And when they had come to the place called Calvary, there they crucified him and the criminals, one on the right hand and the other on the left. Then Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they do. And they divided his garments and cast lots, and the people stood looking on. But even the rulers with them sneered, saying, He saved others. Let him save himself, if he is the Christ, the chosen of God. The soldiers also mocked him, coming and offering him sour wine and saying, If you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. And an inscription was also written over him in letters in Greek, Latin, and Hebrew. This is the king of the Jews. Then one of the criminals who were hanged blasphemed him, saying, If you are the Christ, save yourself and us. But the other answering rebuked him, saying, Do you not even fear God? seeing you are under the same condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we receive the due reward of our deeds, but this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said to Jesus, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus said to him, Assuredly, I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. Now it was about the sixth hour, and there was darkness over all the earth until the ninth hour. Then the sun was darkened, and the veil of the temple was torn in two. And when Jesus had cried out with a loud voice, he said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. Having said this, he breathed his last. Therefore, because it was preparation day, that the bodies should not remain on the cross on the Sabbath, for that Sabbath was a high day, the Jews asked Pilate that their legs might be broken and that they might be taken away. Then the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first and of the other who was crucified with him. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. But one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear, 
and immediately blood and water came out. And he who has seen has testified, and his testimony is true, and he knows that he is telling the truth, so that you may believe. For these things were done that the scripture should be fulfilled, not one of his bones shall be broken. And again another scripture says, They shall look on him whom they pierced. Now when evening had come, there came a rich man from Arimathea, named Joseph, who himself had also become a disciple of Jesus. This man went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Then Pilate commanded the body to be given to him. When Joseph had taken the body, he wrapped it in a clean linen cloth and laid it in his new tomb which he had hewn out of the rock. And he rolled a large stone against the door of the tomb and departed. And Mary Magdalene was there, and the other Mary sitting opposite the tomb. On the next day, which followed the day of preparation, the chief priests and Pharisees gathered together to Pilate, saying, Sir, we remember, while he was still alive, how that deceiver said, After three days I will rise. Therefore command that the tomb be made secure until the third day lest his disciples come by night and steal him away, and say to the people, He has risen from the dead. So the last deception would be worse than the first. Pilate said to them, You have a guard, go your way. Make it as secure as you know how. So they went and made the tomb secure, sealing the stone and setting the guard. What powerful, powerful passages. Those passages are so powerful as they give us an insight as to really what was going on. And there was a lot going on. There was a war that was raging that we can't even see. It was powerful. But why the Feast of the Passover? Why did Jesus lead his men through this final meal before he went to give his life? for all of us. Well, you see, Jesus was doing what was commanded of the Jews. He was doing exactly what his Father, God, had commanded him and them to do. In fact, if we were to go all the way back to Exodus, this is right at the end of the, the plagues that struck Egypt. It was the 10th plague where the angel of death would pass over and take the firstborn. But God, in his great provision, told the children of Israel, find a spotless lamb set it aside for so many days, and then kill it in such a way and cook it in such a way and fix it in such a way and take the blood of that spotless lamb and put it on your doorpost so that when the angel of death would pass over, it would pass over your home because the blood that was shed from this spotless lamb would cover you and keep you safe. And that is exactly what Jesus did for us. Jesus was our sacrificial lamb. And Jesus was continuing this tradition. But the cool thing was that when his sacrifice was given, it was the final sacrifice. The blood that was going to be shed was enough to cover our sins. And Jesus was the bread that we are to take in. He is the bread of life. And this bread that we talk about that the children of Israel had to eat was called matzah. Now, we don't really eat a whole lot of matzah, but this bread was made of flour and water and was baked really quickly so that it did not have a chance to rise. So it was very flat, very tasteless, but it would at least give you something to satisfy the hunger that was within you. And this was God's provision to protect them, to get them out of harm's way as quick as possible. I want you to think about a couple of things. This lamb that had been sacrificed was an unblemished lamb, a lamb without any kind of blemishes. Just as Jesus had to be a perfect, sinless lamb for us. He was the final sacrifice. The bread that they took away represents humility. It had no frills, no extras. It was just enough. And Jesus is the ultimate picture of humility for us. Jesus at one instance was talking with his disciples and his disciples were talking about how they wanted a sign. They needed 
a sign, kind of like Moses had asked for the bread to fall from heaven. And here's Jesus' response to them. He says, Most assuredly, I say to you, Moses did not give you the bread from heaven, but my Father gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is He who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Then they said to him, Lord, give us this bread always. And Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall never hunger, and he who believes in me shall never thirst. I find it so interesting that the two elements that we use in observing communion is some type of fruit of the vine, which represents the blood, and bread, the matzah bread, the humility bread, the quickly baked bread but the bread that satisfies. Jesus knew exactly what he was doing when he talked with his disciples. They had no idea what he was referring to, but Jesus absolutely did. Now before we observe communion, I want you to take a moment and I want you to think about where your heart is. Take a moment and pause. You can pause the video if you would like. But pause and pray and and take a time to maybe confess sins. Maybe you need to call somebody and confess to them or to apologize. Or maybe you just need to sit down between you and God and make things right. Take the time to do that now. Paul, I believe, does the best explanation of communion as he is leading the people in Corinth of of really what it should be like. And here's what he says. For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the same night in which he was betrayed took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. I find it So fascinating that Jesus broke bread and said, this is my body. He is the life that gives us life. He is the embodiment of the very living, breathing word of God. And when we take this in, we are identifying with Christ. We are saying we want to be like him. And so at this time, if you have your bread, I'm going to pray and bless this element, and then we will take it. Let me pray. God, I appreciate all that you do and how you love us and take care of us. But God, I appreciate most of all that your life is our bread, that it is the only nourishment spiritually that we truly need. It is the only nourishment that we will ever need. And so in this moment, may we reflect on what you did by giving your life as a ransom, as an answer to the redemptive plan. God, thank you for redeeming us by laying down your life for us. I ask that in our homes, wherever we are, whatever element we are using to signify your life, I pray that you would bless it as only you can. In Jesus' name, amen. In the same manner, 
He also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Let's pray and bless the drink that we're about to consume. God, again, I thank you. You know, I, I appreciate your life and what it represents for us and what it shows us that we can do. But Lord, I am most appreciative of the blood that you shed to cover my sins so that one day when I stand before God, he will pass over me because your blood covers my sins. Thank you, God, for sending your son, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, for willingly giving up your life and shedding your blood so that my simple faith in that is all I need. Thank you for all that you do, and I pray a special blessing over the drinks that we are about to consume in our homes, that it be what it needs to be to honor you and to reflect what we have all agreed, that your blood is what covers our sins. In Jesus' name, amen. Paul ends with this idea of why, why are we doing this? He says, for as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. The reason we celebrate Good Friday and the reason that we observe communion <clears throat> is we are celebrating his death and his burial. But don't forget, Sunday is coming. God bless you. Have a good night. He didn't deserve what happened to him. Betrayed by a friend for 30 pieces of silver. He was beaten and bruised and given a crown of thorns. He was innocent, completely innocent. Nailed to the cross because of you and me. We crucified him. And even with his last breath, he asked God to forgive us. This is what real love looks like. Jesus died for you and for me so that we could be saved. But this wasn't the end of his story. Death could not hold him back. He rose from the dead three days later, proving to the world he is who he said he is. Jesus, the King of Kings, our Savior.